Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Associate Professor Alice Motion from the School of Chemistry, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to the Royal Society of New South Wales Liversidge Lecture. This event is run in partnership between the University of Sydney Sid uh, Science Faculty and uh, the Royal Society of New South Wales. And it's such a pleasure to see so many people in person. It's great to have these face-to-face -face events um, coming back to campus and we, we're really glad to see you here and we, we hope that you enjoy this evening. Before we start uh, the events of this evening, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're joining on today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. There is no place in Australia, water, land or air, that has not been known, nurtured or loved by Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd now like to welcome the president of the Royal Society of New South Wales, who's going to introduce our speaker this evening. Um, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Susan Pond, please take the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. As Alice says, so my name is Susan Pond, and I'm honoured to, as president of the Royal Society of New South Wales to introduce Professor Richard Payne tonight. He was awarded the Leversidge Lecture in 2020 for his accomplished research on the development of new methods to to access complex biomolecules with a view to addressing important challenges in medicine. This lecture has been delayed, of course, because of the disruptions by the pandemic. The Liversidge Lecture is awarded intervals every two years by the Royal Society of New South Wales to recognise outstanding achievements in chemistry. It was established under the terms of a bequest by Professor Archibald Liveridge, MA, LLD, FRS, a chemist and much more, who is a force of nature at the University of Sydney and the Royal Society of New South Wales for 35 years from 1872. In fact, he designed the seal of the society which you can see. And uh, for those of you who attended the launch of the New South Wales R&D 20-year roadmap last night, this is the 20-year roadmap from 1881, because each of the sections represents the study of the different disciplines that were important to the progression of New South Wales at the time. Our society is celebrating its 200th anniversary this year. We trace our origins back to Governor Brisbane, who was Governor of New South Wales from 1821 to 1825 and whose portrait hangs in the entrance of Government House in Sydney. Liversidge was Professor of Chemistry at the University of Sydney from 1874 to 1907 the first Dean of Science at the University and one of the council members who sponsored the Society's Act of Incorporation in 1881. His portrait, for those who don't know, hangs in the Great Hall here at the University of Sydney. In 2009, the Society and the University published an authoritative biography of Liversidge entitled Imperial Science Under the Southern Cross. The book features the portrait of the Great Hall on its cover. Its author, Roy McLeod, Emeritus Professor of History from this university, is in the audience here tonight and will present Richard with a copy of his biography at the end of the lecture. As Roy pointed out to me, Richard Payne and Archibald Liveridge have much in common. Richard is a fellow of three of the societies to which Liversidge belonged, the Royal Society of New South Wales, the Royal Society of Chemistry, where Liversidge also endowed a lectureship, and the Royal Australian Chemical Institute, of which Liversidge was a founding member. 
Lewisage was the first demonstrator in chemistry at Cambridge and tutored at Downing College, where Richard was a student and completed his PhD. Richard is professor in the School of Chemistry at the University of Sydney. He must frequently pass by a small collection of some of Liversidge's sample jars of eucalyptus oil that's housed in a 19th century cabinet on the third floor of the chemistry building. You'll note that this has been a somewhat unusual introduction for a speaker, uh, but Roy and I, uh, Roy having provided the information, thought that it was important to point out in the introduction the extent to which Richard is part of the Liversidge lineage. I'll leave it to you, the audience members, to read Richard's impressive, more formal biography on the Society and University websites. Richard, we look forward to hearing about your research in your Liversidge lecture entitled Drug Discovery Inspired by Natural Products. So thank you so much for the kind introduction, uh, Susan, and it, it really is a, a great honour um, to, to be here to give this lecture. I know it's been uh, delayed and I hope it's uh, worth the wait, but certainly um, it was great to meet uh, Roy before I started my lecture today and I had no idea uh, how many linkages there were uh, between my life and, uh, and Liversidge's life and I look forward to reading your, your book um, as well at the end of this. So uh, my title today is very broad and, and what I'm really hoping to, to do today is really to give a series of uh, short stories and vignettes uh, about some of the science that we've been doing, um, mainly over the last five years, including uh, a number of stories that are, that are unpublished and, and are very, very recent. Uh, you see I've got a, a big picture of our friend, or not so much a friend, um, SARS-CoV-2, the, the causative agent of the coronavirus, of COVID-19 here, and you'll see some of the work that we've been doing um, in this space as well, using natural products as inspiration uh, for what we're calling uh, drug discovery. But I have to be a little bit careful because drug discovery um, can be uh, different things to different people, I guess. Um, it's a very long process, starting with the identification uh, of a biological target, and then through many, many, many years of discovery, um, hopefully coming up with uh, a product that can help uh, humans, help human health, help human life. And what I would say for, uh, for our lab and, and many labs within universities, we are really working on this left-hand side here, identifying targets, validating targets, developing new molecules to target those, uh, to try and treat human disease, and to try and optimise them. And so we work all the way down here on this left-hand side of this, you know, quite interesting cartoon of, of drug discovery, and we usually finish up here um, with animal testing. So we do in vivo studies to make sure that our molecules actually work uh, in a disease model. Obviously, once we get up to the top here, where we're doing human clinical trials, things get expensive. Um, and usually, this is where we start to partner uh, with pharmaceutical companies. And so, you know, by and large, our success is in this green and this sort of orange sector here. And hopefully, I'll be able to share a couple of really recent stories with you today of, of how we've been able to do that. Okay, so um, just like there is a, a very long process for, for drug discovery, um, there's also lots of different ways of doing it. So uh, many of you in the audience are probably aware of, of the traditional way of discovering a, a drug. Here would be a, a small molecule drug, for example. And usually this is what we call structure-based drug discovery. So we effectively get a three-dimensional picture of the drug target. And this is usually a protein, it's often an enzyme that catalyzes some critical uh, reaction. And we're usually designing molecules that fit perfectly to the active site of, say, an enzyme, stops that enzyme from working, um, and that has some desired biological effect. So this has been done, you know, for, for hundreds of years. This is the way people have, have uh, discovered drugs. There's a second way of doing this. It's a slightly more modern way because it required robotics, and this is called high-throughput screening. And this was big in, in pharma. It still is big in the pharmaceutical industry because you've got to have quite a lot of money for very large compound libraries, usually more than a million compounds, but they're random compound libraries. And they get screened with high-throughput robots against a target of interest to try and find molecules that are starting points for a drug discovery campaign. So that's called high-throughput screening. And then the third way, and the, obviously the, the thing I'm going to share with you today, 
is starting with natural products. So what I would say, starting with privileged molecules, things that have evolved over millions, billions of years to do a particular job in a biological system, and we hope that we can use these as starting points for the discovery of, of drug molecules. So natural products, again, come in lots and lots of different flavours. So there are lots of different classes of natural products. And, uh, you know, we heard about uh, some of the eucalypt natural products in the introduction today. But, you know, there is a vast, and I haven't got them all up here, lots of different families. So terpenes, many of you will be aware of, uh, the anti-cancer drug Taxol, the malarial drug artemisinin, even the little molecule camphor here is a class of a terpene. We have polyketides, so lovastatin down the bottom might be something you've heard of. This is one of the original statins for, for blood pressure drugs, right? Um, we have alkaloids, so lots of famous alkaloids, morphine, caffeine, nicotine. Um, and today, my talk is mainly going to be focused, the reason why I've made it bigger, I'm biased, is I'm going to talk about what I think are the most remarkable uh, natural products, and these are, are peptides and proteins. And for the purpose of today's talk, I'm going to say that a peptide is less than 50 amino acids in length, and a protein is greater than 50 amino acids in length. These definitions do differ depending on who you talk to, but just for the sake of this talk, that's where we're going. Now again, lots of really, really important drugs are peptides and proteins. We've got cyclosporin, the very famous immunosuppressant, is something called a cyclic peptide. Vancomycin is the antibiotic of last resort that's used in hospitals. And then we can start to get bigger molecules. So this one's only seven amino acids long, this one's 11. Insulin, absolutely crucial for the treatment of, of diabetes and the management of disease is, is longer. So we would class insulin as a protein, it's 51 amino acids in length, and we can then get bigger things. And these two at the bottom um, are actually two molecules that we've been working on in our lab very uh, recently. So a spider venom uh, that actually comes from the Fraser Island funnelweb spider called HI1A, which we're uh, working with a group in Queensland uh, for its new stroke therapy. And on the right-hand side here, uh, this is an anti-inflammatory protein that we've been working on um, called an evasin, and it's 100 amino acids. But obviously, proteins can get much, 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 much bigger than that. They can get up to 50,000 amino acids in length. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to focus on the right-hand side here today and walk you through um, you know, some of the areas in which we've been working with little short stories, and I hope there's something for everyone um, in today's talk. So, of course, the big question is, you know, how do we do it, and, and why on earth would you want to make a natural product in the laboratory in the first place? I'm a synthetic chemist. I love molecules. I love building molecules. But, you know, there's got to be a good reason to do it. There's no point making something just for the sake of it and stashing it in the freezer, right? You really, really want to have a reason to be, you know, having fantastic PhD students up the back there from my lab uh, making molecules. And hopefully I've already sort of given you an idea that natural products are very important, they have privileged bioactivity, but they're very complex structures. The problem with natural products is usually when you isolate them from the source, you can only get them in very, very small quantities. And obviously as times have moved on, some organisms that produce these natural products are also really hard to get. So an example might be a sponge a marine sponge that lives at the bottom of the Antarctic Ocean. You can't just go down there and haul up kilograms of sponge to isolate, you know, a few micrograms of a compound. You just can't do that these days. It used to be done in the old days, not possible anymore. So, of course, if we've got really good synthetic chemistry, what I call modern synthetic chemistry, we ought to be able to make larger quantities of these natural products. That allows us to do more biology towards the clinic on them, so that's great. But I think the other beautiful thing about organic chemistry, synthetic chemistry, is that we can make things that nature can't because we can tweak things, we can change the chemistry uh, because we're building them de novo from scratch um, in the laboratory. And you'll see lots of examples of this today where we're making molecules that have improved properties, and I think that's important. So here's, a, I think, a really nice little figure to, to break it down. You know, if we had a family of natural products, as synthetic chemists, the way that we think about building these, and these are not peptides, these are just other types of molecules, but it, I think, demonstrates my point. What we tend to do is we deconstruct these molecules. You know, much like in the food industry now, you know, getting a deconstructed something is a trendy thing to do. Well, in chemistry, deconstructing a molecule in the right way to build it in the fewest synthetic steps possible is also very trendy, right? We want to be able to use as few steps as possible to build these molecules. So this is the deconstruction step. And of course, we can take these little bits here, most of which we can buy from chemical suppliers, they're usually very cheap, um, and then we can reconstruct them to make the natural product. So the analogy here is having a whole lot of Lego bricks and be able to assemble these in such a way 
that we can make that original natural product. And then my second point is really, well, if you've got the Lego bricks, why don't we try and make things that nature is not making? So these are now pseudo natural products or natural product analogs that may have different activity, they may have modulated activity, they may have better activity um, than that natural product. So I don't think I've been very fair to the researchers in my group and the other groups down in chemistry by you know, having the Lego figure in the, the, the Lego lab here. This chemistry, this molecule building is done by real people in the lab, very talented people. We're very lucky in the School of Chemistry and the University of Sydney more generally to have fantastic science students that are able to do this type of complex chemistry. And I'll just show you a, a photograph just in case you didn't know what our laboratories looked like over in F11 in chemistry. Um, these fume cupboards are where people uh, work, of course. We have lots of um, you know, really nice chemistry going on here, lots of fancy equipment that you can't see behind uh, these guys here. So there's some PhD students and postdocs um, from those synthetic labs, which are shared between multiple synthetic groups in the School of Chemistry. We have a really nice collaborative research environment up here. So it's not just people from my group here, but from, from others as well. Okay, so how does nature then make these peptides and proteins? And I probably don't need to tell most of you how this is done because, of course, on the left-hand side here, you know, this is the central dogma of molecular biology, right? We have DNA, we have a genetic code that is the blueprint for making peptides and proteins. The whole point of our DNA is that it mostly codes for peptides and proteins that are the functional molecules of life. That's why I get so excited about them. So DNA, of course, gets converted to the stuff called mRNA. We all know about this now with the, the very successful mRNA vaccines, right? So this is called transcription, this step. It takes our genetic code and converts it into another type of biomolecule called mRNA. And then the mRNA gets translated on this molecular machine called the ribosome. And then that ribosome joins these little red blobs here, which are amino acids in the right order to generate the desired protein. And there's a huge amount of fidelity here, right? It doesn't tend to make mistakes. If it makes mistakes, it's bad. It usually leads to disease. This DNA blueprint, this code, codes for the protein that comes out the end. It codes for that amino acid sequence that comes out the end. And so we know this is important, but in recent years, there's been an additional step added to this protein that comes out the end. It turns out that proteins aren't necessarily just the naked amino acids in a string to make a nice three-dimensional you know, three structure of a protein. We have these things now that we are starting to understand more and more called post-translational modifications. And I'd like you to think about these as aftermarket modifications. So, you know, whenever you go out to buy a car, you can buy the standard car, um, you know, it's got the, I don't know, the, the, the normal wheels, um, or you can put on these aftermarket modifications that makes it a bit more fancy. So you might get some mag wheels, you might get a sunroof. And effectively, these post-translational modifications are these aftermarket modifications of proteins that expands the repertoire of the human genome. And so these modifications, there's more than 300 that have been identified to date, and they can change the function, the structure um, of these proteins. And I only mention this, because I'm going to show you an example of one of these post-translational modifications later. So it gets a little bit more complicated than that, because not all peptides and proteins are made on a ribosome. And we didn't understand this for a long time as well. So it took us a while to realize that some peptides are actually non-ribosomal. They're not made on the ribosome, as the name suggests. But instead, it's like an enzymatic assembly line. Each one of these blobs here is an enzyme that catalyzes a reaction. And basically, one substrate gets passed on to another enzyme to another enzyme and starts to build up these complex peptidic structures. Again, you'll see that they tend to be modified structures. But this non-ribosomal pathway is really, really important for some of the molecules I'm going to talk about um, today. All right, so that's fine. That's how, how nature makes uh, peptides. But we want to do this in the lab, right? We can't just, you know, be wobbling around with ribosomes all the time. And we certainly can't put those special aftermarket modifications in that we want to make as synthetic chemists. So how do we think about doing this? Well, it turns out that there's a Nobel Prize winning technology called solid phase peptide synthesis, where we take a polystyrene bead, okay, so it's just like your normal polystyrene beads, it's just got some fancy chemistry attached to it, and we can basically attach one amino acid at a time, so these are just amino acids that are getting coupled one at a time, we can put these modifications in, so this might be some fancy modification to the amino acid that we've made in the lab, so we can make these designer peptides uh, in this way. And thankfully, these amino acids are very, very, very cheap to buy. We buy kilogram amounts of standard amino acids for next to nothing. It really is affordable chemistry. And so 
The amino acids, in case um, you're wondering what they look like, there's 20 amino acids that, uh, that we use in our proteins, uh, 21 if you ask some people, but let's call it 20 today. And all the amino acids are really similar, right? They have an amino functionality, they have a carboxylic acid functionality, and they only differ by this thing in the middle here, it's called the side chain. So the side chain changes, and it's the side chain chemistry that dictates really the overall function of the protein when you assemble them um, in such an order. So hopefully that makes sense. We're taking a polystyrene bead and we can add the amino acids one at a time, and hopefully you're all sitting there going, this is the 21st century, certainly having got your students sitting there, you know, doing this one at a time in the fume cupboard. And um, of course, we, we don't do that anymore. Um, there's some pretty sophisticated robotics now that we can use. This is what the polystyrene resin looks like. It's this orange stuff that you can see here. Um, and we have these liquid handling robots in, in chemistry that can deliver the amino acids so that they get attached to the resin, okay? And we can attach them in the right order. And afterwards, we just wash the resin. There's little reservoirs and vacuums at the bottom here that can suck everything out. And we can program using software the exact order of amino acids that get coupled in these little syringes. And at the end of the day, after maybe overnight, um, we can basically come and take the resin and get our peptide off it, okay? And then we can use that peptide for our research. So that's how they're made using these automated peptide synthesizers. All right, so I now want to just give a, a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about today with that, with that introduction. So um, I want to, as I say, give three sort of different areas today. Part one of uh, the lecture will be about anti-infective drug leads derived from bacteria. So this guy's a, a marine bacterium, this one's from the soil. The second part of my talk, um, you know, not much to look at these guys, but hopefully I'm going to convince you at the end of it that we can use the molecules that they produce uh, for good. So these are these anticoagulant molecules uh, from blood feeders like ticks and mosquitoes and leeches. And then part three um, is going to actually come back to us, right? So we, of course, also produce some really, really interesting peptide and protein molecules. I'm going to give you a very recent example from our lab where we've found a new immune modulatory molecule peptide from, uh, from humans. So that'll be the end of the lecture after that. So let's just start off on these uh, bacterially derived um, natural products. So um, hopefully you'll all be aware that we have a lot of crises in our life at the moment. And one that, you know, is a bit concerning, maybe we've forgotten about it a little bit, is, is antimicrobial resistance. So we've had this armory of antibiotics for quite a while. Uh, many of them don't work on certain bacteria anymore because they've developed resistance to this panel of drugs um, that we've got. So at the moment, you know, it's still pretty bad, uh, the 700,000 deaths a year, but there was a, a report that was put together by the UK government back in 2015, so, you know, seven years ago now, we've had COVID since then, and uh, these guys, through some pretty deep research, were estimating that by 2050, if we do not discover any new antibiotics, we could be looking at 10 million deaths uh, per annum from antimicrobial infections, and that it would cost $100 trillion to the uh, to the economy. And what's um, particularly bad about this is there's one particular bacterial inf infection that's pretty dear to, to, to my heart, it's something that I've worked on since my PhD, um, is drug-resistant tuberculosis. So tuberculosis, many people think it's a disease that doesn't really affect us anymore, but you know, before COVID, it was still the greatest killer of any infectious disease. 1.5 million people a year still succumb uh, to tuberculosis infection, mostly in countries that really can't afford are the treatment, so mainly in the third world. So, you know, the idea that we might go from 1.5 million, maybe up to 5 million, right, is, is probably, um, you know, not out of the question in case, unless we can get these, um, these new antimicrobials. So there is an urgent need to develop new ones. Um, and it's, you know, it's been a lot in, in the press, certainly before COVID. So it turns out that there's nothing really new here, right? Because natural products have been used as sources of antibiotics since the start of the use of antibiotics, right? They were isolated from natural sources. And, you know, I give an example here of streptomyces, but uh, streptomycin, I should say, which comes from streptomyces, the bacteria streptomyces. If you look at this, this pie chart here, you know, it's remarkable. Between 1981 and 2020, if you look at this, 64% of approved antibiotics were natural product derivatives. You know, 10% were the actual natural products that were isolated. So only the small chunk here uh, were other things that were designed de novo. So the big question is, in 2020, we're sitting there going, we've got this massive crisis, we need new antibiotics. Why didn't we discover any more, right? Because scientists knew this was a problem and they were, they were really, really going after new antibiotics. And the, the problem is twofold, right? And the first is, you know, not one we ever want to talk about, but, you know, in general, I don't know why that's slide forward, but right? 
Um, in general, pharmaceutical companies are interested in developing drugs, there's no doubt about it. But if it's going to be a two-week course for an antibiotic, um, it's less attractive, right? The bottom line is less attractive to develop an antibiotic in business. So I think we've got a real role to play in academia there to try and come up with new drug leads. But the second problem was that, you know, got to the late 1980s and we didn't discover any new natural products because we discovered all the good ones from the things that we could already isolate. So the organisms that we could already isolate, the bacteria that we could grow in the lab. And it turns out that 97% of all the bacteria that we think we know about on the planet, we can't cultivate them in the lab, we can't grow them. So we don't know what molecules they make. And so, you know, there's been this massive drive in microbiology to find better ways of taking bacteria from their you know, natural habitat and trying to get them to grow in the lab, right? That's a really, really big thing. If we do that, we can find new molecules and then labs like ours get excited when we see these come out and we try and make them in analogs to try and do um, antibacterial drug discovery. So I'll just give one really neat example. It's from a few years ago now. This molecule is called texabactin. And I think it sort of hammers this point home quite well. Texabactin was isolated in 2015. And the only reason they could discover this kind of weird molecule here, it's like a little cyclic peptide with a tail, um, is that they could never grow this bug. So it was an uncultivatable soil bacteria. And they kept taking it out of the soil, taking it back to the lab, trying to grow it, and they couldn't grow it. And so these guys in the, in the States, they developed this new um, device called an eye chip. And basically what they did is it's this kind of aluminium device, and they just took the organism and they grew it back in the soil in which it came from. And they could then amplify the bacteria to get enough of it to isolate this molecule called texabactin. And the reason why it was of interest to, to my lab is, is it had activity against mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, and the, the third reason was these authors in this Nature paper, they tried and they tried and they tried to develop resistance against this molecule, and they couldn't do it, okay? And the way that you tend to do that is you feed sublethal doses of the molecule in a laboratory setting and see whether you can get resistant mutants of the bacteria that no longer care that you're trying to kill it uh, with this molecule. So that was really exciting. And so there was this massive global race. Everyone was after texabactin uh, because everyone thought this could be um, the new antibiotic. And it got a lot of press, so even the Wall Street Journal were talking about the texabactin um, as a game changer um, for, for antibiotics. There was all sorts of news agents that covered this. And my lab, like about 10 others in the world, got very interested in making this molecule. And you know, we made it the best way that we thought we could, could make it, and it turned out um, you know, sometimes in organic chemistry, it is a bit of a race, and we were actually the first um, to, to make this molecule, which was a, a bit of an achievement for, from two individuals in the lab um, who, who did this. And so this is the structure of the molecule. I, we use that solid phase peptide synthesis I showed you earlier. Not all robotic, I would say. Sometimes uh, we had to take it off the robot and do things by hand because we were scared the robot might lose some of our precious amino acids. And it turns out this doesn't look like much, this little guy here. This is an unnatural amino acid. It looks a bit like arginine, but it's not. And about 90% of our time to make this molecule was just making that amino acid. It was just one of those things. It was really difficult to do, uh, but we managed to do it, managed to make the molecule. And this has now inspired a whole bunch of labs across the world to generate analogues of this natural product, including ours. Um, and this is still a, a work in progress, but there's been some in vivo studies started um, recently uh, on one of these analogues. So, of course, the big question you might have is, well, why couldn't they generate resistance, right? Because usually bugs will find a way to develop a, a resistance against, against any compound, really. And so it turns out it's all about its mechanism of action. It's very unusual the way texabactin works. So what I'm showing you here, it's a bit complicated, but it is the, the peptidoglycan biosynthesis pathway. So bacteria have this special cell wall, this really thick cell wall that makes it very hard to get things in, including drugs. Um, and it's called peptidoglycan. It's made up of sugars and, and peptides and a little bit of lipid, and it's all cross-linked to make this kind of waxy coat of the, of the bacterium. And we know that this is a really, really important target, right, for antibacterials because penis, whoa, penicillin up the top here and vancomycin, which I showed earlier, they inhibit the cross-linking step to make peptidoglycan, okay? So they actually inhibit the enzymes that cross-link to form the peptidoglycan. And it turns out that the, what texabactin does is it doesn't inhibit an enzyme. So most antibiotics inhibit enzymes, but texabactin doesn't do that. In fact, what it does is it actually binds with very high affinity to a biomolecule, a substrate, that is a precursor to peptidoglycan synthesis. So it binds to this guy here called lipid 2. It's a complex structure. There's some lipids, some carbohydrate, and a little bit of peptide out here. It binds to this with such high affinity that this lipid 2 can't be transferred 
and can't be flipped onto the outside to make peptidoglycan. So the bacteria can no longer make um, this very important layer. And if they can't make the layer, they basically, they just explode, right? All the contents leak out, the bacteria die. So this is how um, texabactin works. And that's why they couldn't develop resistance. Because if you think about it, what would the bacteria need to do in order to overcome this molecule? They don't need to mutate the enzyme, which is easy, right? You just change the genetic code, you change the protein that makes the enzyme. They would physically have to change the structure of the substrate for peptidoglycan. It's a very hard thing to do, and that's why texabactin uh, works so well. So we in our own lab, um, in collaboration with Fearing Pharmaceuticals in the US, we actually did a lot of detailed studies on exactly how um, this texabactin molecule binds to lipid 2 using some biophysical studies. This is a, a form of calorimetry, which many of you um, may have done in your, in your early years in the, in the laboratory. But a long story short is that um, texabactin has a dissociation constant of 100 nanomolar, so it's a pretty tight binder. And what's quite nice is it binds with two to one stoichiometry. So you get two molecules of texabactin binding to one molecule of this lipid 2, which we also think is important um, for its activity. Okay, so I'm just going to move on now to a second short story. So that was texabactin. I'm going to move to these molecules now called the sansamycin. So a really cool name for a natural product. They were isolated from a different strain of streptomyces, so another soil bacterium. Um, and these belong to a, a family uh, called the nucleoside antibiotics. And again, as a chemist, you know, we look at the structure, we go, that's pretty interesting. This looks a little bit like a DNA, RNA, you know, base. And then we've got this peptide stuff coming off, but it's not a normal peptide. In fact, there's no native peptide bonds in that molecule. It's a very unusual molecule. Um, and they had already shown that this molecule, or this class of molecules, had activity against mycobacterium tuberculosis. So again, you're seeing a, a common theme. It's a, it's a bacterial infection we're really interested in. So we said, we like the look of this molecule. It's going to be hard to make. We'd like to find a way to make it. And then we want to be able to make analogs really, really quickly. And this is how we did it. So this was the, the team. So Arne, Emma, and Wendy over about a period of um, about five years, actually, these guys generated more than 100 analogs um, of the sansamycins. And again, it was the same process I showed you earlier. You take the sansamycins, you deconstruct them. We break them down into four fragments. So think of that as four different Lego bricks. And then we can reassemble these in the lab de novo as long as we can synthetically access these three different chunks. And I don't need you to worry about the chemistry um, as long as you can sort of follow um, the general gist there of how these things are assembled. And again, we've got our friend polystyrene resin and solid phase peptide synthesis that helps us uh, assemble these. So I'm just going to share with you um, a few different analogs that came out of these. So these are not sansamycins. They are structural analogs of the sansamycins. Um, there was one molecule here, uh, 395, um, which showed some really, really interesting activity, not just in vitro, um, but also in vivo as, as well. Um, so you can see that you know, the MIC is the concentration of our compound that you need to completely kill the bacterium. So 280 nanomolar MIC, uh, you have to take my word for it, is, is pretty good. We're pretty happy with that. But it also worked against mycobacteria that were dormant. So the problem with mycobacteria is a third of the world's population have this bug in their lungs, right? And it just sits there dormant, asleep. And then at any time in your life, if you're immune suppressed or you get HIV, for example, um, you get activation um, of the bugs and you end up with full-blown TB, right? So it's these dormant bugs we also want to kill. They're very, very hard to kill. But you can see we lost a bit of activity, but not all of it. And then, of course, the other important thing is, do these uh, molecules kill uh, drug-resistant bugs? And they, they do. So this is isoniazid and rifampicin, and then a doubly rifampicin isoniazid double mutant resistance, uh, or resistant mutant, I should say. And the, um, the molecules all show whoops, activity um, against these as well. And then the final thing is, these bugs actually live within macrophages in your lungs. So macrophages are the white blood cells that are there to get rid of infections. And these bacteria are really crafty. They live inside the macrophages. So we also showed that we could get these molecules inside the macrophages as well. So how do the sansamycins work? Well, this took us a little bit longer to work out. Um, so this is exactly the same diagram I showed you earlier. So here's lipid 2 that texabactin binds to. Um, but it turns out that our molecule actually inhibits an enzyme this time, or our molecules, the sansamycins, and the enzyme is called MERX. And what it does, it doesn't really look like much. It doesn't even look like it's that important, but it turns out it's really important. It takes this molecule here, which is a very, very big structure, I know. Again, you've got some sugary bits and some peptide here. And what our enzyme does, does MERX, is it takes this, which floats around in the cytosol, so it's a very soluble molecule, 
and it transfers it onto the inner leaflet of the cell membrane of the bacteria. So it's actually the first committed membrane step of cell wall biosynthesis in these bacteria. So it's a really important step. Um, uh, and we were able to show that our molecules were able to inhibit this enzyme. And so there's a lot of details on this slide. It turns out the enzyme is a structurally very, very complex protein. It has 10 transmembrane spanning regions, right? You can see this here. Each one of these sort of different colored bars is a sequence of protein that's traversing back and forth through the membrane. It's a very hard protein to study. And so it turns out Dean Crick uh, over on the left-hand side here found a really good way to measure its enzyme activity. And it was kind of crude, but it worked. He just took the bugs, he took mycobacteria, um, and he did a little crude membrane preparation. And by doing that, if we could take this fluorescently labeled substrate, which we're able to make in the lab, um, we can actually measure the turnover of this fluorescent substrate uh, onto uh, the lipid, uh, the inner leaflet of the lipid, right? So this is the enzymatic reaction. And of course, as you add more of your sansamycin analogs, you should stop the incorporation of this fluorescence um, into the membrane. And we're able to show that, and you can see these are the IC50s. So this is the amount of the sansamycin analog needed to inhibit half of the activity of this Murex enzyme. And again, they're all nanomolar, and there was quite a good correlation between activity against the enzyme and antibacterial uh, anti activity uh, against uh, mycobacteria, which was really nice. So we then um, did a, a high throughput screen at this point um, against all other bacteria. We're like, well, what do the sansomycins do? Do they just inhibit mycobacteria or do they inhibit sort of everything? Because all of these bugs make peptidoglycan. So presumably we're gonna have a broad spectrum antibiotic. And what we were really shocked to see is that's not the case. The sansomycins are selective anti-mycobacterials. They do not touch any of these other bugs, and we still don't know why. We still do not understand why we're getting the selective activity. So here the MICs are greater than um, 25 uh, millimolar um, in, our, in our screen. I mean, we just can't kill these bugs with these molecules. I think that's really, really interesting. Just to show you how this work was done, um, again, it's done with robotics. So this is a, a pretty standard high-throughput screening robot. Um, so I'll just get the video going. So this robot here picks up a plate that has our compounds and the bugs that have been growing in an incubator, and it slides it along this rail here. And this is something called a fluorescent plate reader, and it basically is able to count the number of bugs um, that are inside that plate, so how well our compounds have killed them. And it's all done through software. You don't even need to go into this room. It just slides up and down on this rail um, and reads out for us. And what you'll be amazed to hear is that these robots were actually designed by one of the key engineers um, at General Motors, right? So these robots could actually lift very, very heavy things, but all they do is carry these little plastic plates around in a really kind of precise way, which is kind of interesting. Overly engineered, but does the job. So Roger and, and Jesse did all this work. They're at Simon Fraser. Roger's the only person I know on the planet um, who has a chair of high throughput screening. So it's really his expertise. He's a fantastic guy and a long-standing collaborator um, of our lab. So we've taken these molecules a little bit further um, just to make sure that they could actually be uh, maybe drug candidates one day. So we're showing that they don't kill normal cells, right? So these are human embryonic kidney cells. The last thing you want to do with a molecule is something that kills bacteria, but also kills human cells. So you want to get that sort of selectivity. These are sort of preliminary studies that we often do. We've also shown that despite the fact that they're peptides, and peptides get a pretty bad rap for their you know, low stability, these molecules have no native peptide bonds in them, so they don't get broken down by the enzymes called proteases that normally chop them up. And in fact, they're completely stable um, after six hours. And they also uh, are stable in liver microsomes, and they don't get oxidized by these P450 enzymes, which we often get worried about um, with our molecules. So these lead analogs um, have gone through a preliminary in vivo study, and we're still working on these at the moment to try and do a, a proper mouse model now. Um, of TB uh, with these molecules here at the Centenary Institute just behind me. Okay, so last short story then for the bacterial uh, natural products. And you know, this is, a, I think, a really interesting one, again, of, of collaboration, I would say. You, you've seen I've, I've named a, a number of collaborators so far. You're going to see some more as we move through. Um, but we had worked for a, a long time. Early in my lab, my first PhD student worked on this molecule called galenamide. Again, we looked at it, we're like, that is a very cool molecule, right? Structurally, it's very unique. Um, but the original isolation paper, which came from Bill Gerwick's lab at Scripps and UC San Diego, um, they showed that it had some anti-malarial activity. We got pretty excited about this because we were also interested in malaria um, back in the day. This is actually Bill 
um, in Panama collecting these samples, right, that he isolated the natural product from. So he didn't just take them, you know, he just didn't take samples from people and work on them in the lab. He actually did all the diving um, himself. And we, um, well, we made a, a very large panel of, of analogues very early on, so about 50 different analogues um, looking at these for malaria. And then uh, when uh, COVID-19 pandemic hit, uh, I got an email from Bill. He said, Rich, you know, um, I remember you made all these analogues, you know, way back when in 2014, that great JMED Chem paper. Um, you know, have you ever thought that these might be useful for SARS-CoV-2 for COVID-19? Because we know that these molecules, they target the cysteine protease enzyme called the falsipane in the parasite. And we know that SARS-CoV-2 has two cysteine proteases that are absolutely essential for the viability of the virus. You know, what do you think? I said, Bill, we should do this. And so we independently here um, in Sydney at the Kirby Institute screened thalidomide A against SARS-CoV-2. And, and Bill was absolutely right. Um, had an MIC of 153 nanomo, very potent molecule in vitro at the virus infecting human cells, right? So it inhibited viral entry uh, into human cells. The NIH then uh, came on board and they said, look, we'd like to screen it as well before we do any in vivo stuff. And so they did it. And, you know, it was a different cell line, but I think, you know, similar sort of activity. So this was really exciting. So we sort of repurposed this molecule from malaria um, to COVID-19. Just to show um, what is a hell of a lot of work, and Arthur, I can see up the back there, I'm not going to do this justice. Poor old Arthur had to make a lot of this compound for in vivo screening. Um, you know, during COVID times, it was very, very difficult. But I'm just trying to get the point across. It's that same approach again. You know, we've got three Lego blocks, if you like, and we're assembling them and we're changing. Each of these R's can be whatever you like, right? We can design that in the lab. It can be whatever functionality you like. We can tune the activity of these molecules. And Arthur has done this for, for a little while now. He's done a really great job at it. Um, I've actually got some chemistry in here. This is just showing how we clip them together. I won't go through all the details, but we always need to activate functional groups in our molecules to clip them together. So we can take fragment B here, we can activate it, and we can clip it together with fragment C. So you can see we've joined that guy to that guy, okay? And then we come through here, and then at the end, we take fragment A and we do another you know, conjugation reaction, if you like, or fusion reaction, where we take fragment A and we join it on to this um, aiming functional group here to generate the final analog. So it's very modular, we can change things up, and we can make analogs very, very quickly. And like I said, Arthur had to produce 0.5 grams of the natural product, right, that there was only, you know, a few micrograms around in the world at the time because they couldn't go back to Panama and, and re-isolate this bacteria, and Arthur was able to make, you know, 0.5 a gram, which was enough to do um, some pretty serious in vivo um, work. Okay, so the big question is, what is this molecule doing? Why does it have antiviral activity? And of course, you know, as chemists, we looked at it, and you know, maybe you look at it and you go, who cares? But you know, we looked at it and we looked at this carbon-carbon um, this, this double bond here, right? And we knew that this was going to be a very reactive carbon. And we knew it was a reactive carbon because this thing that I've got in red here in chemistry terms is called a Michael acceptor, okay? And it likes to react with nucleophilic groups. And so we thought, wow, well, this has got to be it, right? Because the way that the virus enters human cells, it comes in, whoops, it comes in, it binds to a receptor on the cell surface called ACE2, it enters the cell, and then there's these proteases that I talked about earlier. One is called the main protease, one is called the papain-like protease. And these proteases are really important because this virus is not that sophisticated. It actually makes this big, long polyprotein. It makes one protein, and then these proteases come and they chop it up into its functional bits, chops it up into its proteome so that it can replicate, get spat out of the cell and infect another cell. So if you can stop it doing, whoops, if you can stop it doing this and making its proteome by inhibiting these enzymes, this is a very, very good strategy, right? So we looked at the molecule and we said, okay, that's a reactive carbon. These are cysteine proteases. So this is the side chain of a cysteine. It's got a sulfur atom here. This is a, a thiolate. It's a very, very good nucleophile. This is a very, very good electrophile. Nucleophiles and electrophiles love each other. And so this is going to react with that, and that is what our molecule is doing. We're either inhibiting the main protease or the papain-like protease. We're inhibiting this cutting reaction of the, of the polyprotein. Okay, so that's what we thought. We then went and screened, and, you know, these are pretty ugly charts, and I won't spend a lot of time on them because there's not much to say. We screened the glenamide A and all of our analogues against the papain-like protease at quite high concentration. It did nothing. 
We did it against the main protease at lots of different concentrations. If you squint hard enough, you may see a few of them ducking under 100%, but by and large, completely inactive against these two proteases. So we said, oh, this is weird, right? Because it's not a non-specific killing of this virus. We know it's doing a job, so what else could it be? And it turned out from the literature that the virus can enter via two different pathways. It can enter via this pathway here where it fuses with the membrane, or this pathway I'm showing on the left-hand side here, this process is called endocytosis. So the virus comes in, binds to ACE2, and it kind of invaginates in the membrane, and it pops itself in, right? Just forces its way in. And it turns out that if it enters via an endosome, in order for it to get out of the endosome, it uses host machinery. It uses a human enzyme to get it out of the endosome. And this enzyme is called cathepsin L, and cathepsin L is a cysteine protease. So we're like, this has got to be it, right? Cathepsin L, if you inhibit it, you stop the virus from getting out of the endosome, and that's why we can't see it really getting into the cell, right? We can't see it replicating. And what I'm now showing you is an empty chart because it doesn't matter what concentration you go in. This is 500 nanomolar. You completely wipe out cathepsin L activity. So it's a very potent uh, cathepsin L inhibitor. You can sort of titrate it down all the way down to 6.5 nanomolar just to sort of see which analogs are more active than others. You can see some of them are still almost 100% inhibiting at 6.5 nanomolar, so very potent compounds. We then said, okay, this is great. We know what the target is now, um, but, you know, do all the analogs inhibit um, SARS-CoV-2 entry in, in vitro? And the good news was um, they did, um, but what was really interesting is the parent natural product, galenomide A, we weren't able to improve on it. So for malaria, we found lots of better molecules by making analogs, but here, Nature was best, so galenomide A was the most potent. This is a 28 nanomolar, as I said earlier, inhibitor of viral entry. And here's just one of our analogs that, you know, was looking very, very good, actually, in some more late-stage studies, so I just highlight that one as well. This is in Vero E6 cells, which are actually monkey cells, but we've also shown um, the molecules work in uh, human lung uh, cells as well, which is obviously a bit more physiological, which is great. Okay, so I'm just going to move on to the second part now. Um, that's the end of the bacterial part. Um, and start to talk about these anticoagulants from, from blood feeders. I'm going to show you the two next stories are much shorter than the, the first one. So we got very interested very early on again in the lab in these blood feeding organisms, not because they're good to look at, but because of the types of molecules um, that they made. And you know, again, we're not the first to look at these, right? Leeches have been around in ancient medicine, right, for ages and ages. And in fact, you know, heridin, which is the protein that is produced in quite large quantities um, in the glands of the leech when it bites you, it secretes this, is a really, really potent anticoagulant. This is what it looks like. It's a 63 amino acid protein. It's got you know, quite a lot of folding in it. It's got these disulfide bonds that I'm showing here. But what's really interesting is a lot of people for a, you know, just looked at the protein. They didn't look at those aftermarket modifications. And our lab some time ago now started to look at these aftermarket modifications because heritin is not produced just as the naked amino acids uh, in the leech. In fact, it's produced sulfated on this tyrosine residue and glycosylated down on this threonine residue. So we started very early on to try and understand what these modifications um, were doing. So heritin uh, produced recombinantly is used in the clinic. So it's an anticoagulant used in the clinic, but it has some pretty serious side effects if it's not used um, properly. You know, you can buy products off the internet. So these are heritin tablets. So they're effectively, you know, leech head extracts where they've taken the leech heads and mushed them up and added a few bits and bobs. They don't look very appetizing. And of course, they'll never work, right? I mean, proteins are never going to be orally bioavailable. So this is, don't buy this stuff. Um, there's, a, um, there's a product on the market, which I thought was really cool for varicose veins. So this is called vein care. And you'll see here wild heritin extract. And if you look at the products of this, it's just, again, leech heads, mushed up, mixed with some cream and some perfume added, right? There's nothing special about it. Um, and then even in France, you can buy this stuff, um, and this is the before and the after. And uh, again, it's just, a, it's just a leech extract, right? So it, it, it is used. Um, some of these things will work and some of these things won't work, and I won't make any more comments um, on that. <laughs> so these aftermarket modifications, I don't have time to, you know, I'm, I'm very fond of these modifications. I don't have time to tell you everything, but... This sulfation is really important. It's, it's a type of post-translational modification. I've told you it occurs on tyrosine residues, and it happens in something called the Golgi apparatus. So as proteins are getting sort of moved out after being made on the ribosome, they go through the Golgi apparatus, which is this funny-looking, you know, wobbly structure here. And these enzymes called TPSTs, they transfer sulfate as things are leaving the Golgi. OK, 
Okay, so we end up with tyrosine residues that usually have an OH group here, and it plonks a sulfate group on it. And again, you probably say, so what? Well, it turns out that this sulfate's absolutely crucial for the activity of these anticoagulants, okay? So we have spent the last seven years just really playing with some super interesting molecules for some super interesting blood feeding organisms. So we started with the leech, I told you about that back in 2014. We worked out what the modifications were doing. We moved on to a tick that you can find up uh, on the northern beaches called Haemophysalis longicornis. And we showed that if you sulfate at two sites here, we showed that it was natively sulfated in the tick at those two sites, you get a very potent uh, thrombin inhibitor. So 410 picomolar, right? We started at nanomolar. Now we're three orders of magnitude, even more potent when we get to picomolar. So that's pretty cool. And then, you know, here's another tick. This one's from South America, actually. We're down at five picomolar. Again, it's got two sulfate groups on it. I'm summarizing a lot of uh, uh, really awesome work from the lab, so apologies to the group members who are involved in this that I'm going through so quickly. Um, and then the next three examples I think are really cool, right? So this is the Anopheles albumanus uh, mosquito. So this is the mosquito that transmits Plasmodium falciparum, the causative agent of malaria. So it's always the bad guy, but it produces a pretty potent um, anticoagulant. All these blood feeders are producing these anticoagulants that thin blood so that they can drink your blood and feed and use it to make their own proteins, right? That's how they survive. They need to feed on blood. This guy here is called the Setsi fly, and the Setsi fly um, carries the, the parasite that causes African sleeping sickness. So again, not a very nice fly, certainly not a good parasite. This is such a short molecule, and yet we're now in the femtomolar range. So we come another three orders of magnitude down um, to femtomolar. So this is one of the most potent inhibitors um, ever made um, of the thrombin enzyme that these target. And then finally, we've got this flea down here. This is unpublished work from Josh in the lab. This is the, um, the flea that carries uh, the, the, the bug, uh, Yersinia pestis, the cause of the bubonic plague. So this is the exact same flea. We're going to use it for good. Uh, Josh has already made an unmodified peptide that's a seven picomolar inhibitor um, of thrombin. So we've got these, this suite of really potent molecules. But we've also got these really amazing technologies in the lab. I've talked about solid phase peptide synthesis, but one thing that my lab has done, and Susan talked about it a little bit in the introduction, is we've developed new methods that allow us to make very complex biomolecules quite quickly. And it turns out that we've developed these methods called ligation methods, where you can take two peptide bits and you can join them together very, very quickly. And you know, the importance of this is what it allows you to do is to make libraries of molecules. Now, for the chemists out there, of course, what we do in, in medicinal chemistry is we take small molecules and we make you know, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of molecules to try and find a drug, right? Because you need to do structure activity relationship studies. In proteins, we normally don't do that because they're so hard to get hold of. But now we've got these great methods. We can join together lots of different fragments to make large libraries of these sulfur proteins that are derived from these leeches and ticks and mosquitoes, but we can Frankenstein them. We can take a bit of leech and a bit of tick, we can take a bit of mosquito and a bit of flea, and we can join them together to make better molecules. And this is some work that we've started to do. It's, it's unfinished business, but I thought I would share that with you. We're calling it medicinal chemistry on proteins, and we're, we're really excited about it. The idea is that you can take, you know, 100 of these fragments and 100 of these fragments and combinatorially assemble them to make very large libraries in 96 well plates. You can then read out their inhibition of this enzyme thrombin that is the reason for their anticoagulant effects, right? Um, and you can also measure their anticoagulation in, in plasma all in line, right, as a sort of a high throughput uh, methodology. So this is a work in progress. This is where we're going, um, but we're really excited um, by it. And the idea is that, you know, out of your screen, you can just like in small molecule drug discovery, where you might make a thousand molecules, but you pick maybe three lead compounds that you're going to progress closer to the clinic. We can do the same. And so here's an in vivo study of our best two compounds that came out of this initial screen. This is a thrombus in a, in a mouse after a needle injury. So the red are the platelets and the green is fibrin that makes up a blood clot. And you can see here when we come in with these inhibitors, we can actually visualize um, these molecules basically dissolving the clot, right, in vivo. So it's really exciting. So we have now sort of moved on and, and said, this is great. You know, we can make these molecules, we can make them quickly. What's the unmet need, right? We already have anticoagulants. We have warfarin, we have heparin, they're used in the clinic. So what? How are our molecules going to be better? Well, there is an unmet need because anticoagulants can't be used in particular indications. And one of those indications is ischemic stroke. 
um, which is the second most common cause of death and the leading cause of disability in the world. Um, it doesn't care about postcode, whether it be the Western world or the third world, right? People suffer strokes all over the world. And believe it or not, despite so many people suffering from strokes, we have one approved therapy, it's called tissue plasminogen activator, um, but it only works for about 30 to 40% of clots. So what, they, what the, this tissue plasminogen activator does is it breaks down um, this molecule plasminogen to plasmin and the plasmin dissolves the fibrin of the clot. That's how it works. And it does that, it does it pretty effectively, but because there's all this thrombin inside the clot, this enzyme thrombin, the vessel re so it re-clots again. So you open it up with tissue plasminogen activator and then it closes up again. So ideally what you'd want to do is add TPA and add a thrombin inhibitor so that all the clot-bound thrombin that gets thrown out gets inhibited as well, and we know that this works, right? If you do it in in vivo models and animal models, it works, but the problem is in humans, um, anticoagulants can't be used for stroke because they cause such serious bleeding side effects, right? And so you don't want someone bleeding on the brain um, when you treat them for stroke. What we need um, is an anticoagulant that disconnects its anticoagulant effects from its bleeding effects. And you think, well, the two go hand in hand. Certainly that can't be done. But because we made so many molecules, we must have made 100 of these different derivatives. We have one molecule that does this, one molecule that can bust a clot but doesn't cause um, serious bleeding. And this molecule is called AIS-109, um, and this is the team um, that is now pushing this forward. So it's a collaboration between uh, our lab and, and Sean Jackson's lab at the, the HRI. What I'm showing here really um, is that our molecule, we can basically run the concentration right out to quite high concentrations, and we never get serious uh, bleeding, right? The, the, the blood clots eventually um, a little bit. And you can see here, the heroin and agatroban, or maybe you can't see because it's so steep, these are the black ones. So if you treat with the clinically approved anticoagulants, even at low doses, the, the blood never clots, right? And of course, this is indicative of what the bleeding risk would be. So we've got this weird plateau effect that we've never seen in any other inhibitor, um, and things are looking really good. We've got this really big, what we think, safety window for being able to use um, these molecules. We've also shown in, in something called a tail bleed model that um, indeed these molecules don't cause serious bleeding um, if you deliver them um, to an animal. So here's heridin, that's the leech derived one at one milligram per kilogram, two milligrams per kilogram. You get a lot of blood loss through this tail and this tail bleed model here. But for AIS 109, there's not even a dose response here, right? 10 and 20 uh, migs per keg. We really don't see serious bleeding. So we think that it has a safer, anticoagulant profile. We don't think it's going to cause bleeding, and that's really exciting. And then finally, um, here is another in vivo model where Sean's lab has actually joined it together with TPA, that exact experiment I told you about earlier. So this is TPA alone. You uh, injure the vessel. This is the carotid artery of the, of the animal, and you've delivered TPA. So you can see blood flows, blood flows, blood flows, blood stops, and then you get this little bit of recanalization. This sort of lump that you're seeing here is blood starting to flow again, but then it re again, okay? If you come in with TPA and AIS-109, basically, um, this is the injury, so blood stops, blood stops, then the molecules make it to where they need to be, and then you get blood flowing again. So the artery opens um, and it stays open. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. I've tried to acknowledge people as I've um, gone through. Um, I have been incredibly fortunate over the last 14 years at this university um, to have the most amazing um, students and postdocs that have worked in the lab. Um, you know, I'm really proud of each and every one of them. Many of them have gone on to their own academic careers and careers in the pharmaceutical industry. I've tried to, to highlight some of them, at least for the work that I, I described today. Um, collaborators are really important. So to do the sort of work that we do, we need to have really great collaborators. And again, we've been so lucky both here at the university, um, but also um, elsewhere across the world, right, when we used to be able to travel a bit more, um, to have these discussions and to really push our science forward. And I really thank all of those people. I'd also like to thank all the funding agencies um, for supporting the work um, that we do, um, the Royal Society of New South Wales um, for the honour of the, of the Livers' leadership, and obviously to be able to do this two years later um, and give me the opportunity to do that, I really, really appreciate it. And thanks for all coming tonight. It's so good to see so many of you I'm here and I look forward to catching up um, after the lecture for, for drinks and, and nibbles. So thank you again.
Thank you so much, Rich. That was a fantastic talk. And um, to hear about things from psoriasis to COVID-19 um, and also to have that really important warning about the leech head uh, French cream. Just in case anyone's stuck up on, on that, you've been, you've been sold something that might not work. So thank you for that. Um, we do have time um, for a couple of questions from the audience um, this evening. Um, our canapes are waiting, but we'd love to hear your questions. And Cass and Caitlin will be bringing a roving mic. There's a person with a hand up with a stripy shirt. We might go here first. Thank you. Um, simple question. Why, how come 97% of bacteria are impossible to culture? Yeah, look, I'm not a microbiologist. I don't know the exact answer. I think it's a combination of also having not discovered all the microbes that are out there as well, right? So it's a combination of the one, we've got a whole bunch that we have found that we can't, we can't replicate effectively in the lab and others that we know they should be there based on gene maps and we just haven't found them yet. So it is a combination of those two things. I would feel uncomfortable answering why the microbiologist can't do it, because I'm not a microbiologist, but it's amazing, right? I was amazed when I was told, so, yeah. It's a question just at the back, Caitlin, the person in the blue jumper. Yeah, thank you. Please, Richard, that was a very engaging, fascinating talk and phenomenal work. Thank you. Can I take you back to the beginning of the talk when you presented the three different models for drug design? Um, now, you, you actually, um, you, you, of course, do all of those things. You, you, you do do structure work and you do combinatorics. So they're not mutually exclusive. No. But um, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts about the technologies that underpin them and where you see drivers moving in the future. And just by way of illustration, the, the structure design work, I think, really took off in the 80s with the invention of the um, uh, workstation and visualisation tools. And, of course, X-ray crystallography. Um, the combinatorics was an, a, a technology of the 90s because of all that sort of flow stuff and robotics. And you've mentioned a whole string. I mean, throughout your talk, you mentioned these uh, lots of automation um, and, and, of course, the, um, what was it, solid phase peptide synthesis. So I'm really interested to know what, in your opinion, has done technologically most to drive drug discovery over the last 10 years? What do you think is going to do most to drive drug discovery in the next 10 years? And which of those three phases of the diagram do you think will lead in the end? Great. OK, so I'll, ask the, um, I'll answer the, the, the first part first. So you're absolutely right. Um, <laughs> Structure-based drug design was... You know, you couldn't do it without X-ray crystallography. So when we could solve more and more protein crystal structures, the, the, the rational structure-based design became the best way of doing drug discovery. And it still is a, a dominant method, right, of most pharmaceutical companies. Um, the second method, high-throughput screening, is still used by Big Pharma, but by and large, maybe except for a couple of institutions, high-throughput screening is not accessible to everyone because... The high throughput screening I showed was, you know, 100 compounds with 100 different bugs, right? It's still high throughput, but it's, we don't have the compound libraries of a million compounds. Now, um, I don't want to say too much here. I think there are, in high throughput screening, there are good libraries and bad libraries. And some academic institutions have bought close to a million dollar libraries. But if the, the library is no good, you're not going to discover a lead compound or even a starting point for a drug that way. Pharmaceutical industry's done it pretty well, but I would say when you turn up to conferences, it hasn't solved all the problems that structure-based design did. So there are drugs on the market that started out with high-throughput screening, but there are way more that were discovered through structure-based design and through natural products as, as leads. Your comment on combinatorial chemistry as part of that is absolutely true. There was this combi-chem phase that lasted for a decade. Everyone bought the workstations. Everyone was doing things on resin like we do. Um, and then it died, right? I mean, I mean, virtually nobody does combi chem these days unless they really, really have to. Um, natural products, I think, will always be there. And as we discover more of them, I think, you know, rational-based drug discovery and uh, natural products-based drug discovery, they're going to, to remain. But, you know, that was not an exhaustive list of the way that we discover drugs. So you asked me where things would be in 10 years. Um, I believe, and I'm biased, um, 
that there will obviously be more and more biologics, right? So I didn't put that on my slide, right? I mean, being able to take a monoclonal antibody um, and treat a patient, I mean, you know, these things work really well. They're just horrendously expensive at the moment. But as technologies progress, you know, something that might cost $40,000 a year for a tumour right now may cost 4,000 bucks, right? And, you know, obviously wealthy countries can afford these, these types of therapies as, as well. So I really think that things are going to move more towards, towards biologics. And a big part of that is this personalised medicine, right? The fact that we know now, you know, genes that cause disease and, you know, can we, can we silence certain genes? Can we upregulate certain genes? Um, so there's going to be a big push for personalised medicine. There already is. And I think as our technologies move on, that's where I think we'll be going. So I think there'll be more biologics and I think there'll be more personalised medicines. But that's just my, my view, right? We've got time for one more question. There's one up here in the front. And Dina might just disagree with what I said. So this could be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Hey, brilliant insights there, Richard, and, and uh, some, some beautiful discoveries. Um, I was intrigued by many, but I'd just like to ask about the last example you gave us uh, of this anticoagulant that's sort of self-limiting. Um, pretty unprecedented, I would think, and uh, not to be expected. What made you look for it in the first place? <laughs> yeah, good question. So um, everyone could hear that question, right? So I think I said, you know, we've made hundreds, about a hundred of these molecules, and we, had, we basically set up a standard screening workflow, right, where we measured the inhibition of thrombin. First thing you do, super simple, in a plate. The second thing we always did um, is to measure the APTT. We wanted to know at what dose could we get an anticoagulant effect. And, you know, 99 of those compounds, as you increase the dose, just the clotting time just went just like heroin and agatroban. And then we saw this one molecule, and it was just serendipity. It just... It went like this, we're like, something wrong with the assay. We did it again, we did it again, we did it again, we did it again. And we've repeated that assay, you know, loads of times. And I don't know if anyone from Sean's lab is here, and sorry for having to do that so many times. But, um, you know, it didn't make sense, right, because there hasn't been a molecule like that that has worked in this way. So, you know, you probably want to ask about mechanism, and the answer is we just don't know, right? We know it's a really good thrombin inhibitor, but we don't know why we're seeing these weird plateauing effects with the APTT as we increase dose. Maybe a transient effect, right? So we've got lots of things to look at now as part of this TTRA grant. So, you know, we'll run it for as long as we can until it dies, right? I mean, at the moment, it looks great. So, yeah. Yep. Thanks so much. And I'm sure um, Rich would be happy to answer questions um, over some canapes in a moment. Um, but thanks for the questions so far. I'd now like to just invite... Um, Emeritus Professor Roy McLeod uh, to come and present uh, Richard with um, a special uh, gift and to say a few words. Um, Emeritus Professor Roy McLeod um, completed his first degree in biochemistry and history at the University of Harvard and then a PhD in history of science at the University of Cambridge. And um, uh, Roy now works very closely with the University of Sydney Nano Institute and, and looking at uh, policy and science. And Roy, if I could invite you to come just behind the lectern, then we'll be able to hear you a little bit better, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for an exciting and informative uh, lecture, which I very much appreciated as a would-be uh, <laughs> uh, chemist in my youth an apostate chemist, I'm afraid, uh, turned to medicine and latterly to history. I very much appreciated all you had to say. And it's a particular uh, pleasure to me uh, because I was able to associate you so well with the life of Archibald Liversidge, whom I discovered when I first came to Sydney as a person who had been to Cambridge, as I had, but who had managed to transform so much in uh, Australian science being the first important chemist in Sydney, who built the chemistry building, now the pharmacy building, in the university, who built uh, the, uh, <laughs> a number of institutions, including the, uh, the um, Powerhouse Museum and the Association of uh, uh, the uh, Australian New Zealand um, Association uh, for the Advancement of Science, and also an anticipated the formation of the Academy of Science. 
He was a multifaceted person, but he was also a multifaceted chemist. And he embodied in many ways, just hearing you, many of the traditions of generalization, cross-fertilization, uses of new technology. He was the first one to, in Australia to anticipate the uh, presence of trace elements, for example, gold in seawater, <laughs> uh, exploration uh, by uh, biological determination of plants, uh, exploration of geological strata according to biological determinations, for example. Became very interested in, in uh, biogenetics. And in many ways, it seems to me that you are uh, a wonderful uh, person to inherit that, that legacy. And it's with great pleasure, therefore, that I um, offer you um, a small contribution, somewhat heavy, but still small uh, contribution. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Just switch the mic back on. Thank you very much, Emeritus Professor Roy McLeod. And um, I'd like to ask you, invite you all to join me in thanking Professor Richard Payne once again for a really fantastic lecture this evening.